Hello everyone. We are back to talk more Glint and TypeScript. This one's not going to be 90 minutes long because neither of us have that much time. <laughs> but also because we got through the hard stuff last time. We have so far covered how the template DSL works as well as the big picture architecture of Glint. Today we're going to take a step back and say, okay, we showed you that template DSL over and over again in excruciating detail. Excellent detail, excellent detail, not excruciating. It was awesome. How did we get that fancy, fun DSL from Glint in the first place? So welcome back from vacation, Dan. It's time to go back into the salt mines, coal mines, Glint mines. Glint, there's something sparkly in here. So. <laughs> cool. Uh, let me move your face so it's not on top of my code window. There we go. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think at long last we can actually dive into Glint Core. And specifically, the transform submodule. And, and remember, everybody, we were in Glint template, more or less, basically the entirety of the last two times. So now we're in, now we're in Glint core. We did. We dove briefly into some of the environments to look at uh -huh. details there, and we'll do that some more today. But this time, rather than maybe, coming at it from the actually, side. before we keep going, maybe it's worth reminding people. Uh, let's pop open and look at a preview of the markdown or the uh, the image that we link in the markdown of the overall structure in the architecture. Um, this oh, that's not like, work. <laughs> we're professionals. <laughs> <laughs> we thought this through ahead of time. If you command shift P and preview, we'll get it. Um, ah, okay. so that actually loads the image. That's great. Yeah. Here we can see the overall shape of it. And then this is the one I was thinking about. We've been looking at that template DSL so far. And to and that's why we had to talk about the Glint environments a little bit so far, because Glint environments have these two points where they plug in uh, as part of how core knows what to do with the transform and then as what the transform output does in terms of the DSL. It has to have the right types from the environments. So we've talked through the template DSL. If you don't understand it, I don't know why not. It's not complicated or anything. That if, if you don't understand, it, that's totally fair. And that's why there are something on the order of uh, two and a half hours worth of DSL stuff you can go back and watch through at your leisure. Uh, but today, the transform and maybe tiny hints of what happens in the CLI and the LS. Ooh. Yeah. Um, yeah. So like we talked about last time, I will remember not to gesture with my cursor because no one can see that. But the transform <laughs> emits references to types that go through the environment. So we talked a ton about Glint template last time. But one of the specific details there is that Glint template is never directly referenced in any of the DSL. It's always in terms of the re-exports from a specific environment. And we dove in a little bit to how that uh, has ramifications for how globals are resolved and things like that. So that's this sort of upper purple square between transform and template DSL. Mm -hmm. This transform box is what we're going to be diving into deeply today. And then also sort of this lower purple square to look at how the environment affects the sort of configuration that goes into the transform that adjusts its behavior. So let me make text a little bit bigger and... Ooh, so big, so exciting. <laughs> so yeah, but the core of Glint's transform stuff is this rewrite module function. Um, we'll come back and talk about diagnostics a little bit later, assuming I remember or Chris reminds me. Um, really <laughs> diagnostics, what we... remember. Yes. Really, the bulk of it is in this rewrite module. So this takes a reference to some instance of TypeScript that we're mm -hmm. not going to worry about too much. It's something that the core and the language server have to deal with. But for here, we just take it for granted that TypeScript is available. It accepts a script and or a template. Um, I guess we require a script, but not a template. And we'll talk about that. And then whatever the active environment is. And we'll dig into these types and what that actually gives you access to as we sort of go in. Um, but the big picture is we go through and we look through and say, OK, where are, I need to stop hovering over things. <laughs> where are the things that look like templates in this file? Let's like pull those <laughs> out um, and locate 
um, anything that looks like a template and sort of prepare for the process of transforming that into the DSL that we saw earlier. Uh, assuming we find anything that looks like a template, if we don't, we just short circuit and say, nope, nothing to do here and save ourselves a bunch of work and heartbreak later. Mm. Um, assuming we do that, then we actually go through and say, okay, for each of these things, we need to turn it from a template into that DSL. And that's going to give us out most of what we call correlated spans, which again, we'll dive in on. Um, and then our finally, final step there is to actually do the final transformation, do a bunch of annoying just sort of like arithmetic to calculate offsets and things like that such that what we end up with at the end is a string that is the dsl that we spat out that's what you saw every time i did that show ir command mm -hmm. in the editor last time and then an array of correlated spans and this i guess is a fine time to go look at what that actually is it is uh an input and a mapping tree that we'll look at and a bunch of numbers and these numbers are all subtly different from each other, which is why every single one of these fields has a comment explaining which is which, because otherwise I wouldn't remember. Thank goodness. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we'll talk about the numbers in a minute. A source file you saw mentioned in rewrite module, um, script and template are both source files. If we actually look at what that is, it's a very simple type. It's just, we want to know the file name and we want to know what's in it. So mm -hmm. that's, just the base object that we're passing around all throughout Glencore as we look at things anytime you get to sort of the file level. Um, and as I mentioned, we always have a script that's coming in. We may or may not have a template. And the reason for that is um, in sort of classic Ember, you had these HBS files floating around everywhere. And mm -hmm. in Glint, even if you don't have a backing script for that, we have to sort of synthesize a certain amount of TypeScript boilerplate or JavaScript, as the case may be, to be the non-existent backing class for that component. Um, even a template-only component does have some type information associated with it. And even if you haven't gone out of your way to type that anywhere, we're always going to synthesize very merely an empty script file for the context of processing a template. Template, on the other hand, is totally optional because in things like Glimmer X or the modern um, single file component setup we have with first class components, component templates. Um, there may not, be, may not be a standard template file, standalone right. template file, oh, sorry, long day. Um, it's fair. Yeah, but we do, the key thing here to note is that we take these things together and that's gonna come back up as we dive into more of the um, other parts of Glint Core later is how do we figure out what script and template go together and make sure that we're treating these things as an atomic unit? because that's really the only way we can from a type perspective. And so we have to do a lot of the work that the Ember resolver traditionally has done at runtime. We have to make sort of a best effort guess at doing that statically just based on what we see on disk. So yeah, I guess really the answer, and we'll talk about what a transformed module actually is later. Um, let's just dive in, I think. I like it. So calculate correlated spans. So as we do this, we are going to accumulate several things. One is directives. That's stuff like glint ignore, glint expect error, glint no check. So that's these are these at comments that basically say, hey, something about the normal type checking behavior of this file needs to be different. So as we're going through, we accumulate those. Uh, we generally, you see errors here. This is not type errors. We are way too early in the process to be doing any type analysis. Remember from last time that we don't know anything about the semantics of the files we're looking at at this point. Right. This is all strictly a syntactic step. Um, and so what these are is specifically transform errors. That's going to be things like, this is this looks like a template, but you have a syntax error. Or you have, I don't know, like a, you used if as a helper or something like that, where we really just <laughs> sort of like throw up our hands and are like, I don't, I don't know what this is. Um, so, go ahead. Clarifying note here, directive there, if I remember right, is TypeScript's notion of a directive, right? Uh, TypeScript, I think, may also call these things directives, and they ah, these are yeah. they are modeled after TypeScripts, but they are our own. Um, okay. In part because we do we have to think about things like when you say glint no check, that applies to the template, but not to the entire mm -hmm. file necessarily, and things right. like that. Right. Um, and then finally, we have these partial correlated spans, which is a subset of that type that I showed earlier. Um, to start with, we're just looking at like, where did this come from? Where did the template start? How long was it? And where are we, 
inserting it into the transformed offset. Um, original start versus insertion point are subtly different because if there is a file with multiple templates in it, then original start will always be in terms of the original source file. But as we insert template after template, insertion point is shifting up or down depending on the relative lengths of these things in the resulting output. Um, and then finally, again, the mapping tree, which is its own topic that we'll get to. So immediately we do what anyone who's got experience with code mods or anything that sort of looks like this will be familiar with. We want to parse the string that we got and get out an AST, and in this case, some additional emit metadata, which we'll talk about. If we dr drill in on this, we immediately pull the file name and contents out of the script. We sort of look at it and just set up some machinery for gathering this emit meta metadata. And this is where we start seeing that the environment can actually play a role in how these things work. Specifically, we're saying, okay, we figured out what the extension for this file is. Let's see what the environment can tell us about that. Mm. The main place where this comes into play today is if you're looking at the Ember template imports environment. Mm -hmm. That has these custom preprocess and transform steps that are today implemented in terms of the Ember template imports add-on. Right. Uh, Long-term, this is a very piecemeal process, about to the same degree that the implementation in Ember template imports itself is. Um, these are the bare minimum hooks that we need to be able to mostly make this work. And if you actually drill into this, you'll find that there are things you might expect to be able to do that you can't, or things that look a little weird when you get into this sort of pre-processing and transform step. Um, but the gist is that pre-process takes whatever the arbitrary contents of the file may be and turns that into something that we expect to be able to um, parse with TypeScript. Mm -hmm. And then transform does suitable like follow-on updates to that produced AST to make it into something that actually looks the way Glint internally expects a script with templates to look. Um, Long-term, I expect that we will want to deprecate and drop these hooks from environments. And right. now that the format for FCCTs is standardized, I think we just want to make Glint Core itself aware of the embedded template syntax and probably just use content tag directly. Yeah. And, and to provide a little color for folks following along, the mentality here was basically the same as it was for when we developed, and particularly when Zurak developed the Ember template imports runtime, or rather build uh, plugin. We didn't know what the final format was going to be. The Ember framework team intentionally made a choice to say, we want to ship the primitives and try some different things, let the community experiment with different things and see what washes out of that. And then when I ultimately wrote the proposal that became first class component templates, which still needs a better name, but it was the best one I could come up with at the time to signify what it was actually doing. Think of it as template tag. Uh, then we picked one, but for Glint to be able to work with Glimmer X, which was an experimental implementation that informed some of that design or for the Glimmer X inspired version of the template imports proposal and the one that we actually are shipping, the template tag version, but also people mucked around with, and we never ended up at a spot where they were able to wire up in Glint, but could have things that looked like Svelte or Views style single file components. This was sort of the, here's the bare minimum to make that possible in the same way that Ember template imports itself was, here's a place where you can hook in and kind of have input and a specified output that this is what it needs to look like. Nobody intends for Ember template imports to be the exact mechanics of how we do this long term. Ed's implementation, Ed Faulkner's implementation using a fork of SWC's parser of an actual content tag thing. Much better. We all want that to ultimately be where we're going. Similarly, now that we don't need this, great, let's get rid of it is kind of the, the thinking here. But in the same way that the build had to support this mechanic to support a bunch of different potential authoring formats. So did our type checking infrastructure. We had to be able to support different ways of getting to the same output. So that's kind of the, the reason this is shaped the way it is. It's not because we love it. It's because we had to solve that problem. And now that problem's going away so we can get rid of this. Yay. Yep. And if we look at this emit metadata, um, 
you'll see that it you can kind of see some some clues here that may be easier to see if we go look at the template imports environment of like exactly what we're doing. Mm -hmm. You kind of turn your head and squint and you're like, oh, okay, this really is pretty specifically to support the funny template embedding that we're doing over there. Um, but if we go back to this parse script function as a whole, if you really just kind of like gloss over this part, which is <laughs> pre-process and, tra pre -process and transform, and then this part, which is transform, if you take that th these two hooks out of the equation, this whole function is really just a wrapper around TypeScript's own parsing mechanism. Yeah. Um, and so at the end of the day, what we're getting out of this is, OK, maybe the transform told us, like, hey, we need to tweak the contents of this file a little bit. But fundamentally, we're getting a TSAST out of this. And I have jumped around too much. OK, we're back here. <laughs> so once we've got our AST and whatever metadata we care about, we run over it and gather some more information. Um, in particular, and again, this is an internal detail of Glint. This is sort of a not quite public, but established convention between Glint and its environments today is that the way we represent templates is as tag strings. Mm -hmm. um, this predates the RFC for an actual JavaScript friendly representation of embedded templates. Um, if we were doing this again today, we might make it look more like that depends. But at least for the moment, the way this works is we represent these things for TypeScript as tag strings. That is the sort of like parser friendly version of a template that we deal with. And so what you'll see here is we are, as we're looking over the AST, we're checking anything that looks like a tag template expression. We're pulling off whatever init metadata was given to us by the transform. And then we are going through and saying, okay, this is probably a template. Let's see what we got. Um, Oh yeah, we also don't de traverse into declare module. That was a really strange bug we had early on, where if you had something that looked like a template uh, in a module declare, things got strange. Not worth going into. But um, <laughs> in the end, you can see that this is, you know, I promised above that we're accumulating these three things. And mm -hmm. in fact, we are doing that for each tag template in the thing. And then we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, for now, calculate tag to we have two things worth looking at. We have calculate tagged template spans and we have calculate companion template spans. So everything I just talked about with the pre-process pre and transform and all of this sort of AST munging that we're doing is for things where the template is embedded in the script. So that's Got it. GTS and GJS files. That's gonna be um, anything with Glimmer X. That's also standard Ember tests where we're using mm -hmm. Ember CLI HTML bars to embed templates and tests there. All of those things will be calculate tag template spans. Calculate companion template spans is for handling what we talked about earlier, where we're passing in a script and also possibly a template file in. And if we've decided that those two things are associated, then we need to somehow embed the contents of that template into the script. And so we'll look at that in a second. Um, but whereas here, we're doing this for every single template embedded in the thing, this is happening at most once if a template was passed in. Right. Whew. Okay, this is going to look a little bit familiar. Once again, we are accumulating directives and errors and partial stands, spans. Um, and here we're doing a little bit of checking to see, okay, is this thing actually a tag template? Like if the tag is an identifier, we bail out. Um, we do some work to check, hey, is this thing, can we figure out where this came from? If so, we resolve the tag info. And this is a good moment, I think, to go jump into some of how environments work, because this is mm. super salient here. Um, essentially, what we're doing here is TypeScript's AST is not very fun to work with for this kind of thing. But, um, <laughs> uh, essentially, what we're doing is looking through and saying, OK, yeah, let's look at the imports. And if we can find it and it matches a configured template tag, then we say, yes, this is definitely a template. This is not just some random tag string that we need to ignore. Right. So let's go look at environments. We have this Glint environment class. Um, it's essentially a bunch of utility functions sitting on top of uh, a combination of the, no, I'm reversing my composition. This is just a bunch of utility functions sitting on top of the export from an environment. So if we go look at what that looks like, uh, of course I picked the long complicated one, so let's not start with that. <laughs> 
I mean, that's obligatory. You just have to give everyone a little a little shiver down their spine of the, the difficulty ahead of them. <laughs> yeah. So here is the Glimmer X environment. Um, and this accepts arbitrary config from your TS config. So you may have seen if you dug into the docs that like you can say in your glint hash, you have an environment key and that can just be a string or an array of strings, or it can be a set of key value pairs where the value, the keys are the name of the environment and the values are your configuration. So this is where things that we talked about last time, like additional globals and special forms, this, the default configuration for all of this comes here and then is merged in with whatever else you might be passing in. So this should all look familiar because we looked at it in the past. Uh, if we come down though, the thing we're actually returning here is pretty minimal for Glimmer X. All we're saying is if you import HBS from Glimmer X slash component, here is a bunch of configuration for how you should treat that any tagged string as a template. And that points back to all of this stuff, like what are our special forms? What are our known globals? Where should we be importing the DSL from? Um, Makes sense. And so if we come back, nope, not there. Still don't want to look at that. <laughs> Too scary. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> yes. So if we call get configured template tags, that's what's actually, there's a little bit of munging around of data that happens in here. But at the end of the day, what we're getting out is the configuration that comes from the environment that says, okay, here are the globals, here are the special forms, so on and so forth. We do a couple of things internally, like building up a regular expression so that we can very quickly just tell them mm, the source file definitely doesn't import anything that looks like we should know about it. So we're going to just skip it over. Um, and that very quickly and we, part is why we're doing it with a regex, not with an AST. It just yes, lets us exactly. nope right out. Uh, there's nothing that even looks remotely like this. Cool. Move on. Because it turns out ASTs are expensive and any time you can skip work when you're doing all the kinds of things we have to do here, skip the work. <laughs> mm -hmm. In particular, Glint originally used Babel for that parsing, and that was more than an order of magnitude slower than the TypeScript parser. So we, yeah. the cost trade-off here of using a regex versus actually parsing the file is better than it used to be, but still it's much faster That's to do fine. that quick check if we can. Particularly, this is something I had never really internalized until I started working on Glint, but if you start looking at all of the files, TypeScript loads and parses, just starting up a project, it's dozens or hundreds of like library DTS files and like all kinds of things that you don't really think about. And so if you can save yourself the trouble with those of doing any of this extra work, it's generally going to be worthwhile. So if we jump back here, uh, yeah, resolve tag info, my editor history is not going where I want. Okay. Um, at the end of the day, what this is doing is saying, okay, we're looking at a tagged template literal. Is it something that the active environment knows about? If so, then we're going to process it as a template. If not, we're just going to return all of our empty arrays mm -hmm. and say, nope, nothing happened. Um, we don't let you do interpolation. That shouldn't be shocking to anybody. Um, but then from here on out, we actually start, OK, we pull out. Where should we importing the types from? What are our globals? And we pull out all, some of this span information that I was talking earlier about, OK, start mm -hmm. and end and content. This is all very tedious and we're not going to go too in depth on it, but you can you can look at it if you want and see, you know, oh, there were lots of off by one errors that we had to deal with over the years. <laughs> um, and then there's also a little bit of nonsense around like maybe the environment synthesized an import so that we could recognize it, but it's not actually there. So we need to consume it to make sure or not consume it or consume it based on whether it actually Details. If you're genuinely curious about this, feel free to find me in Discord, but it's not worth worrying about for the most part. Right. Um, we similarly then go through and following that same kind of fun process we did before, looking for imports that looked like template tags, we're going to now look for imports that look like uh, special forms. So like if you import the and helper from Ember Truth Helpers and that import path is configured to be treated as the and and special form, this process will find that. Finally, after gathering Ooh. all of this stuff up, we enter into this template to TypeScript function. And I'm going to skip it for now because that's the point where our tagged string implementation and our companion template implementation rejoin each other and go back to doing the same thing. So we'll talk about that after we do the companion template stuff. Um, 
But the gist is we've just done all of this work to figure out like, okay, what are the nitty gritty details about this template in the context it's mm -hmm. operating in? And once we've got all of that gathered up, then we hand it off to the core transformation process. Um, finally, the output of that has some number of additional transform errors we go through. And if we know where they are, we push them into our errors array. Otherwise, we just say, mm, something's wrong with the entire template. We'll just mark it on the tag because we otherwise don't know what to do. Um, we go through and same deal with the directives. We make sure those are added in. We build our partial spans. And finally, we're done. We're done. Thinking about that, uh, we just put it on the entire tag comment you just made. I had not put this together before, but that is why sometimes you will just see red squiggles over the entirety of your template tag to template tag in an Ember template imports thing. Is Sometimes we have a situation where we know see if location but if not we just have to say the whole thing is bad please figure it out mm -hmm. and it'd be nice if we could do more and better than that uh what in general kind of just high level summary here dan what are the things that prevent us from having a location we don't you know we don't have to go dig into all the nitty-gritty but uh the big one is at a minimum, the types for Glimmer syntax, and I think, in fact, the reality as well, they play some games where uh, it's an error, but depending on which version you're on, like there's probably some location information attached under these weird keys, and you may need to process it to turn it into something useful or parse it out of right. a string, but it's sort of there, but it's not guaranteed to be depending on how things failed. And so there may be errors coming from the parser that it's just like something's wrong with this template, and we don't have any more to go on than that. Um, I think we'll see that when we get to template to TypeScript. Um, I'm trying to think if there are any other cases where we don't have a location. Anything we're generating ourselves, we should have some kind of location mm -hmm. for. Um, the other thing to note is that this is not the entire tagged string. This is specifically the tag. So like if you have HBS backtick blah, 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 it's the HBS that gets the squiggle here. Got it. Um, this was an adjustment we made specifically in response to something that annoyed me about the ESLint rule for Glimmer X, which was that it didn't do this. It if anything was wrong in the template, the ESLint rule would it just be like squiggles thing. everywhere. Yeah. Um, there is another place I think we could adjust where I was noticing this the other day. If something is wrong with like an argument you're passing to a component and that component has like a giant default block, mm -hmm. the entire thing from start to finish gets red squiggles. Right. Um, which is like, not incorrect because the entire thing is the component <laughs> invocation, but like arguably right. it's not uh, particularly helpful or meaningful to someone trying to debug it. Right. When TypeScript gives us a narrow enough span that we can say it is this specific arg that something's wrong with, then that's generally fine. But if it's mm, you forgot a key that was a required argument or something like that, mm -hmm. we ought to be able to do some work to narrow that to just like the opening tag or something yeah. rather than the entire indication. So yeah. if you're looking for, I don't know if I'll call it a good first issue, but a good ambitious first issue, uh, that might be a fun thing to dive in on and try and fix because I think that would be really helpful. Because as is, if you also have errors inside whatever block you're passing to the component, you won't be able to mm -hmm. see those until you fix your arcs. Um, yeah, it I think that overwhelming. it's frustrating. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, so let's jump back up to rewrite module for a moment. So, OK, we found all of our embedded templates. We can look at the companion template. This is once again going to look very familiar. We're mm -hmm. gathering up errors, directives, and spans. Instead of getting configured tags, we're getting our configuration for standalone templates. So Emberloose, for instance, has right. template config for standalone templates. Other environments typically do not. Um, Here's an instance where we have a location, but it is just the entire, like, sorry, this whole file is red squiggles for you because the, your environment doesn't support this. <laughs> um, so for example, if you were in Glimmer X and you tried to use something that was just a standalone HBS file, I assume that's where we would see that. Or yes. in a hypothetical future Ember strict mode uh, environment, which would be sort of the evolution of today's combination of Ember Loose and Ember template imports into a mm -hmm. well-defined environment, which we talked about a couple 
a couple episodes back that that's where we ultimately want to go anyway. If you were in just the Ember Strict mode, this hypothetical future one, and you were trying to hand around standalone HPS files, you would see, hey, I, I'm, I don't know what you're doing, man. Please <laughs> do, do something <Yep>. different. <laughs> We do, so the template imports environment today requires Ember loose as a peer because it uses a bunch of types from in there. It doesn't reinvent mm -hmm. all of them. But you can, even if you have both installed, if you only configure end of your template imports, mm -hmm. you'll also get this error in that case. Um, so if you're looking to yep, really sort of emulate sense. this hypothetical Polaris future, then you could, that's a path you can take. I think we talked about that in Discord the other day. Um, going right ahead, we're checking a bunch of the same things as before. I will call out one of the things we have to do when we have an HBS file in a backing class is figure out, is that backing class, Which is there a backing class? class? And if so, yeah. is it something that we can associate a template to? And so in general, what that winds up looking like is very similar to what we looked at when we uh, expanded the DSL for like a GTS file where you've embedded the template in a class body. We basically end up doing the same thing with the contents of the HBS file. Um, it's loose mode instead of strict mode, and there are other changes like that. But otherwise, it's the same association of, okay, here's the backing class. We're calling mm -hmm. template for backing class or whatever it is on the DSL. Um, so we do a little bit of crawling around the AST for the script file to see, hey, is there something here that we can associate to? Um, and if there is isn't, this then... Where we... Go, Go ahead. ahead. You were saying if this if there isn't, then we... And oh, then we ask. ended up mostly treating it like a template-only component. Um, mm -hmm. I think we have, we make sort of a best effort if the thing looks like it, there isn't default export, but we can't see that it's syntactically a class. I think mm -hmm. we have, I forget exactly how we handle that, but we do something and I think it'll work except you won't have access to like private fields and things. Um, that makes sense. I think we basically treat it like an anonymous subclass of whatever arbitrary value you have there. So my question is, is this also where we take into account the fact that Unlike with GTS files today, where the only thing that can be the backing class is either a Glimmer component or a template-only Glimmer component, for a standalone HBS file, it could also be a controller, and there may also be associated route info, which I think we synthesize special things for if there's not a controller, because Ember's routing and controller relationship to templates is one of the oldest remaining parts of Ember. Is that here or is that someplace else? So this is after that step. Um, by okay. the time we've entered into any of this transform stuff, we already have a concrete script and a concrete maybe template Got that it. we're operating right. against. from before. Right. And so this is really just, regardless of what that script is, we're looking for a class that is the default export. And that might be a controller, or it might be a route, or it might be a component. Again, we don't have type information to go on here, so we're really, right. syntactically, it all ends up looking the same. Mm -hmm. And the way we affect how that behaves is with the stuff we looked at in the DSL two that episodes ago, where we have the template context right. uh, special symbol. And so that dictates, OK, if the thing you found yourself attached to is a route, then like you have access to a model arg, and that's about it. Also yep. controller, but like it's not a useful thing anyway. Um, <laughs> so, this is all fundamentally the same behavior, whether it's a component or a router, a controller, or whatever else. Um, oh, yeah, here we go. So if it looks like a class, then we stick it in there. Otherwise, we do some things. Oh, yeah. Huh. Now I remember. Um, export default is the bane of my existence for a variety of reasons. But oh, in this specific case, yes. it's because it means you can have a default export that is not nameable. Mm -hmm. So what we actually do here is import default from ourself so that we can give so it a name. So we can name it. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> we specifically amazing. say, OK, we do the same trick we did when we needed mm -hmm. uh, an alias for the library without re-importing it every time. We say, OK, this is just an object, but please believe me when I cast it as the default export of whatever module I happen to be in. Um, and then we go through the same process and ultimately wind up back up here. Mm -hmm. So let's finish this and then we'll do template to TypeScript because right now we've yeah. got a big collection of errors, directives, and spans that we need to turn into something useful. 
uh, we did calculate correlated spans. Yeah, so we're here. So again, if we went through all of that work and didn't even find any templates, then we're done. We bail out. We don't return to transform module at all. We just return null and say, nothing special here. When TypeScript apps about this file, just hand it off directly. Don't do any extra work. Um, otherwise, we have this sort of partial span information as we've located templates along the way. We need to, again, just do a bunch of math, essentially. Um, and you'll see we have a lovely for loop where we do a bunch of math and we add and subtract. And um, it's horrible. I hate it. This, <laughs> every time I have to touch this, I'm sad. But thankfully, I haven't had to touch it in a really long time. I think it's as right as it's ever going to be now. So yeah. Um, and then finally, we go in and calculate the actual transformed source here. Um, this looks very similar to what we did earlier, where what we're doing is we're saying, OK, we have a partial span for every template we've identified. We now, I keep using this word span. I haven't actually explained what this means. Um, a span is a fairly common word you'll come across when you're talking about dealing with large mm -hmm. chunks of text. A span is really just like some slice of that text. And so here, what we're dealing with is we have correlated spans. So that is a span of text in the original source file, and we're correlating it to a span of text in the transformed source file. So a correlated span is all of the information you need to know to map between those two things. Um, at a very coarse level, it really is just, this is a stretch of text, and it maps to this stretch of text. Mm -hmm. Within a template, we get much finer grained, which is these mapping trees that I keep glossing over, and we will talk about, I promise. Um, but in the meantime, what we have, we have spans for all of the templates that appear in the file and just sort of like open air gaps in between them. And so what this is actually doing is going through and basically filling everything out so that we have complete information and can ask the question, hey, for a given offset in this file, does it have a correlated span? And if so, what does it correlate to? And remember specifically with... Um, these standalone HBS files, that can get a little hairy because the answer to what does this span in a .ts file correlate to might actually be a span in a wholly different a file. thing in that other HBS file over there because the synthesized yep. TS file that we're presenting to TypeScript is the merger of whatever source TS source file, if any, or the one we made up and <laughs> the HBS file that it came from. Like if you're thinking about a standalone template only component in Ember loose mode, we're going to hand TypeScript a TypeScript file that we synthesized out of thin air and all of the correlated spans in it are in an HBS file over there. <laughs> so there's no original script file to refer to and we have to map everything appropriately. <laughs> but in the end, again, this is just oops, math, adding and subtracting and not pleasant code. I'll, I'm glad I'll I don't tell like my to daughters anymore. who sometimes wonder about how useful their math is. My elementary school age daughters. Hey, I spent a whole bunch of time today looking at <laughs> basic arithmetic in my programming world. <laughs> Still useful. Mm -hmm. So we get our actual string and our sort of complete set of correlated spans. We toss those in this transformed module object, which sure we can open up and take a look at very quickly. Um, and then we hand them back. And congratulations, rewrite module has rewritten the module and we're done, other than all the parts that we didn't talk about. <laughs> um, but the point of a transform module is basically, well, the comment says it as well as I can. It is the result of transforming a TypeScript module with one or more embedded templates along with a potential companion template. This is what gives us the ability to ask questions like, OK, in the transform file at this offset, mm -hmm. where was it originally? And the answer is definitely an offset and possibly a whole different source file. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have basically the back and forth versions of these two things just you scroll down and down and down, and it's just more of that stuff. Because we have to ask this question in a lot of slightly different ways to get slightly different answers, but they're ultimately very similar. Um, yes, that's all we really need to talk about with this. Let's do template to TypeScript. So we've talked about big picture. Here's a chunk of text that's a template. Here's a chunk of text that's TypeScript. We need to be able to sort of alternate between these things and keep track of which was which. Within the template, this is where we actually start dealing with all of the DSL stuff that we looked at previously. So 
here's this function. We saw where we called that both for embedded templates and for companion templates. Mm -hmm. It takes a ton of configuration. Um, we have the original template as a string input. And then we need to know things like, where do we import the DSL from? Mm -hmm. What globals are available? What metadata did the transform give us? Uh, is this associated to a backing value? Do we need to add arbitrary text at the beginning of this? This gets at stuff like um, if you like if you've imported a template tag that you use to tag your string. When we actually emit the template, we're no longer tagging a string with that anymore, and so we need to just insert a bare reference to that somewhere in the template to avoid having TypeScript say, "Hey, you imported right. HBS but never used it." Right. Um, embedding syntax. Ooh, I don't remember what that is. I think this has. Let's see where we use this. Find all references. Something in tagged strings. Where did it come from? Script.contents.size. Oh, this is, I think, oh, specifically. This is the Ember template imports shenanigans for how we present this, right? Yeah, we um we need to know how long the whatever syntax caused your template to be embedded in this. We need to we don't care what the syntax was, but we need to know how much space it took up mm -hmm. because we have to be able to account for that with things like offsets. And this in particular, we also care about it for things like um, the auto but no check script, where we need to be very careful about how, where we're inserting that comment and make sure we're not accidentally like clobbering your embedding tag yeah. or something. And notably, while we had to implement this for the way that Ember template imports has a clever hack to make it work, um, same thing's going to apply with the transform from, I think, RFC 929 or 930. It'll be linked in the notes for this, but where it has a reasonable JS representation, not kind of a hacked one using static blocks and stuff, it'll have the same rules. We'll still need to know this kind of offset to get those things to work correctly. And so you can see here specifically what we're doing is before we even go parse the template, we are inserting white space into it in the amount of the length of the prefix and the length of the suffix. So um, finally, or not finally, but I mean, sort of finally, there's a return mm -hmm. statement there. We're starting to see things that might look vaguely familiar, like emit template boilerplate and emit top level. These these mm -hmm. remind me of things I've seen before, Dan. <laughs> so we have this map template context contents thing that's wrapping all of this other work. It takes the original template as import as what well, as input, as well as things like our embedding syntax, and gives us back a template AST and this mapper thing. And we will talk about the mapper in depth in a minute. Um, but the gist is that it has a bunch of things on it. Um, mm -hmm. So we do, you can see we have another return here. Everything below this is hoisted functions um, because, I don't know, I didn't really want to keep track of all the bookkeeping of actually passing things in and out. So we do the same thing as the TypeScript team and we're like, hmm, scopes are good. We'll just put everything in lexical scope and it's fine. And it generally is. Um, we have TypeScript. You can trace identifiers around pretty easily. The only real downside is just that this file is huge. Um, mm -hmm. But in fact, I find it generally pretty easy to navigate and you can sort of command click between things and it's it's navigable. Um, yeah. But basically this is all in one giant closure because otherwise we would be sitting on a class with like a million different state variables that we had to sit mm -hmm. on top of. Um, or or we'd be sitting on pure functions where we had to pass things through. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, and in fact, this mapper keeps track of most of that state internally for us so that we don't need to think about it. We just have mm. emit and record and then some range lookups. So um, yeah, let's we'll look at some of these emit functions. After you've seen a few of them, they all start to look the same, but it's good to just get a, the gist of what they look like. So what we're doing is we're saying, okay, we need to emit some amount of template boilerplate, and then we just start iterating through the template. For every top level statement in the template AST, we're gonna spit it out. And you can see, okay, this is a top level statement. We check what type of block it is or what type of statement it is. If it's a right. top level block or a partial statement, I don't, well, partial, that's just not legal in Ember. Um, 
I don't know syntactically how you would produce a block without it being the child of something else. I don't, like, I don't know how you get a block as a type level, top level statement, but the types say that you can, so we account for it here. Right. Otherwise, we go through and we handle text nodes, or we handle comments, or we handle mustaches, you know, and you, we can follow this through and through and through. You'll see, so in the boilerplate, mm -hmm. We have to do a little bit of a song and dance because if we're working against JavaScript files, we can't put type annotations anywhere. And right. so instead, what we do is we uh, do JS doc. And this was largely implemented by Aaron Singer. Yeah. Um, which was great. That was one of the first big sort of outside contributions we had to Glint was support for this. And it works really nicely. It's It's mm -hmm. a great part of the story for like, Hey, we don't have full TypeScript everywhere, but you can still get things like hover information and limited completions for like local properties and stuff, even without any explicit type info. Um, here you can see where we say, okay, is it a backing value or is it just an expression? We talked about that last time. You can also see our immediate reference to big gamma and mm -hmm. that whole silliness. And this is where, when we talked a little while back about the only place you see the DSL in a way that you can click to it is when you emit the IR. This is why, because the way that it gets emitted is just us strings. Uh, um, very carefully constructed strings, as you can see here, but fundamentally we're just emitting strings. And so there's no way for TypeScript to see this. This isn't a list. We don't, we're not actually dealing with a quoted ASTs that the language itself understands or something like that. We, we just have tag template strings. It's, Good luck. Uh, but this is where to look when you start wanting to know where do these things get emitted is, mm -hmm. oh, okay, find something that I see my IR has dot template expression. And I'm trying to understand what it is. This is what it is. This is where to find it. So you'll want to search for things like this and you'll see them all in this transform in template to TypeScript. And you might ask why we're doing all of this in terms of strings, um, because you could be forgiven for thinking it might be cleaner and better to just emit a TypeScript AST. Mm -hmm. And there are really two reasons why we don't do that. Um, one is that the TypeScript AST is really difficult to work with, specifically when you are <laughs> creating synthetic nodes. Mm -hmm. Their AST is not actually so A. It contains a lot of concrete syntax information, including yep. things like white space offsets and stuff like that. And even in their like public, strictly typed construction methods for all of their AST nodes, it's trivial to construct a node that in fact is not valid and will blow up down the line. If you haven't included the right syntactic, like, oh, yes, this had two characters of preceding white space in the like three places where that matters, um, really the only way to consistently get valid top to bottom TypeScript ASTs is by making TypeScript do the parsing itself. And so it's really, really painful to try and do that by hand. Yeah. The other reason is that we care a lot about the very specific formatting of the text mm -hmm. we emit, because later down the line, we need to be able to say, OK, there's a red squiggle on this exact offset of text, and we need to know what that corresponds to in our original source. And if we just built an AST and then serialized it, we wouldn't have that information. There's no guarantee right. what formatting the serializer will use even if you just like tweak your version of TypeScript you're using, they may change how they format stuff when they print it. Um, so instead, we do this all in terms of text. And again, it like maybe feels a little bad at first, but as you kind of go through this, I generally find it pretty easy to work with. Mm -hmm. um, you have to keep a little bit in your head of like, oh, okay, if I'm seeing closing braces here. I'm going to have to scroll up a few lines, and I will see. In this case, I think these are actually our... Nope, mm -hmm. here. OK. Bad <laughs> example. The, the boilerplate was a bad place for me to start. This is one of the worst functions in here. They tend to be a lot more straightforward. Um, this is sort of a recurring link thing. A I always dive in on the first The spot. other day that said, uh, at, at some point when you're building a compiler in this way, which is for the reasons Dan just said, basically the only way we can. Well, at some point, you're going to have something where you can accidentally have unmatched opening and closing braces, and then you're in for a bad time if you're not very careful. 
spoilers, here we are. But generally, we haven't gotten that one wrong. But if you're working on this, that's a thing to be aware of. If you emit an opening curly brace in this, you really need to be sure that you emit a closing curly brace. <laughs> and you will generally find that we never have pending state like that hanging out across functions. Like right. in emit object expression, if we open a curly, we close it in that same mm -hmm. function. And this is the example, the sort of example I was trying to show earlier when I confused myself because the boilerplate is heinous. Like really, you're gonna see little blocks of like, okay, we're starting to do something and then okay, we're done doing it. And then anything inside is mm -hmm. happening within that context. Um, so here, this is anytime we want to emit an object literal. If it's empty, then we just emit nothing. Otherwise, open, iterate through the pairs, key, colon, value, comma, new line. Um, and as we scroll through this, I, if there's anything in particular you think is worth looking at here, Chris, I'm happy to dive to it. But I, all of it really just like, right. OK, if you kind of think about what is the pattern for, like here, we're doing an, this is unless, basically. Mm -hmm. um, as an expression. And so it's a standard JavaScript or TypeScript ternary operator, yeah. not condition, question mark, expression. If there's an alternative, we emit that. If there's not, because that's allowed, you can just have like, unless foobar, we emit undefined because TypeScript, you have to have something after the colon, but in the handlebars, right. you don't. And yeah, so this is, I don't know, like a thousand plus lines of that, but it's all, none of these functions are very long. They tend to be you know, yeah. a screen full at this inflated font size that I'm at. And they're all very like, okay, this is an unless statement. This is right. a block statement. Um, you'll see where, a lot of the time. We said it's mechanical. It, it's really mechanical. You just have to actually emit the right things for the construct you're representing. Yep. Uh, you also occasionally find places like this where the Glimmer syntax AST doesn't have position information for something we care about. Uh, in this case, like where are block params? In some of the early beta releases of Glint, we had some really nasty bugs where if you're, the name of a block param matched the name of an arg or something, your curlies would show, or the red squiggles would show up in the wrong place. Or mm, So yeah, for the most that. part, uh, I think we've got those squashed now, but there are a handful of places where if I got to redesign the handlebars AST from scratch, I would add more position information. Um, but yeah, so really all of this is just calls to these things that I've glossed over, like init.txt or init.newline. And so let's actually dig in on that. And that may be the last thing we have time for today. Uh, where is my mapper? Yeah, so mapper is this type. It has a couple of utilities for saying, hey, I have an AST node and I need to know just like what are's, what's its offset mm -hmm. in source. And similarly, like I have a line offset given to me by handlebars. What is the actual like character offset range for that line? Um, so behind the scenes, it just does the math once and then we can ask that question as often as we want throughout mm -hmm. the transformation process. We then have these two verbs, record and emit. Um, record doesn't produce any output. It just says, hey, something happened here. And so the two things that we might record are an error where we can say something is wrong. Here's where it is. That's where transform time red squiggles come from. Or we can say, hey, we found a glint directive. It's of this kind. It's at this location. And then based on what it is, mm -hmm. what the area of effect it has. the whole rest of the template? Does it affect the next node, et cetera? Mm -hmm. um, and that's... This has come up in a few different issues that people have asked why we can't just use like TS ignore under the covers and things. But as you may have sort of noticed in the DSL, there's no concrete mapping between TypeScript and handlebars in terms of like specific lines. One line in TypeScript might be many in handlebars or vice versa. Yeah. And so because these directives are all based on the thing on the next line, um, we have to be very specific during the transformation process as we are looking at this AST to say, okay, the thing that we are emitting TypeScript for covers this range. So regardless of how much area that TypeScript covers, this directive needs to apply to all of it. So that's record. Finally, we have emit. And we can do things like, OK, add a new line, or everything we emit from here on out should be indented further. And most of this doesn't really matter. Like We could emit the whole thing on a single line as long as we had put semicolons in the right places, and it would be fine. 
but um, for sanity of people debugging, it tends to be nicer to have it. <laughs> and so you Imagine saw when I'm I... trying to see that IR without indentation or dedents or so on. Right. Um, and so it's still, you know, it's not perfect. Like we clearly, it's easier when you run prettier on it after the fact, but it's at least readable the way it is, whereas it absolutely would not be if it were all in one line. Um, and then we have a few things here. So we can say, we just need to emit text. Don't worry about the details. It's just text. Know that it corresponds to whatever we're actively working on. Um, there are times when we need to emit TypeScript that doesn't correspond to anything in the source. Um, the, a lot of the template boilerplate is a good example of this, where it's like, okay, we spat out some TypeScript here, but like if it produces an error, if something goes wrong, we don't have anything in the actual template to point to when things went wrong. Mm -hmm. um, so actually for the boilerplate is another good example of like, if you get a type error in that, when you were asking earlier when we might not have a location, right. this is an example of where you would have that. Um, and then we have the opposite. We may have something in the template that we don't want to emit any TypeScript for, but we do want to note in our mapping information that there was something mm -hmm. here in the template. Um, an example of this is when there's like plain text in a template. Yeah. We want to know that that's there because we talked about this a little bit last time. We don't want to do things like, we don't want to treat it like empty space in code where you would start getting completions and things when you started typing. We need to know that like, okay, there's no TypeScript here, but there is something and we should not treat it as just empty space. Um, we can specifically say we want to emit an identifier that maps one-to-one -one between TypeScript and handlebars. And this is these end up being often sort of the leaves of this mapping tree. And I'm still alluding to the mapping tree without showing it. I promise the reason we're talking about this first is this is how we build that tree, and then I'll show you what it looks like. But so when you, when you say um, hash is a terrible example, when you say link to in your template, um, that is an identifier both in your template and in TypeScript. And so we want to very specifically be able to say, okay, these two things correspond to each other. I am emitting an identifier into TypeScript that corresponds exactly to the corresponding identifier in the template. We have this extra option here because there are cases where we may need to tweak things. There are things that are valid type uh, handlebars identifiers, but not TypeScript identifiers, things that have dashes in them or um, cases where we may like need to quote keys and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so there may be situations where the length in the template is slightly different than the length in the emitted TypeScript, but we're still saying this is a one-to-one -one mapping. These represent the same identifier, even if they have to be spelled slightly differently. As a good example of that, link to in traditional uh, curly quote invocation rather than angle bracket invocation is going to be spelled L-I-N-K dash to and that's going to get parsed as link minus two <laughs> if right. you in certain cases if you don't do the right thing so it's important that we actually account for that and we we ran into this while adopting glint at linkedin where somebody hit one of these and the error you get out of that is very confusing because typescript tells you that t you can't subtract something, a variable that isn't in scope. And you're like, I don't know what you're saying, TypeScript. Well, different different syntax, different rules for what's allowed. Here's Here we are. And so for instance here, if you were in an environment that didn't have link to as a global, then the red squiggle Same. you got from TypeScript would include the quotes here because that mm -hmm. whole string is the thing that's invalid. And we need to know that the thing, including the quotes actually corresponds just to the identifier mm -hmm. in here. And so that's where this HBS length comes from. And finally, we have for node, which is here at the end of the interface, but it's arguably the most important piece of it. Um, this is what lets all of the rest of these things work. As we work our way through the syntax tree, every time we descend into an interesting node, we say emit for node that node, mm. and then pass it a callback. And inside this callback, everything else we emit at whatever offset it might be we understand in the resulting mapping that, okay, anything inside here corresponds to that node in the template. And yeah, let's go, uh, I don't want to look at mapping tree itself. I want to look at one of the tests. It's easier to see there. Mm, this one, yes. 
sort of. So these things are difficult to visualize at the best of times. Um, yep. But we have some debug output. And often, the easiest way to actually see the visual is just to look at the test where we're checking the debug output here. So we've done all of this work. We've crawled the AST. We're sort of doing all of our bookkeeping as we go around to say, OK, anything we emit here corresponds to this node. These identifiers map to each other one to one. The thing we produce is this mapping tree. And so what we do, let me scroll back up and actually look at the source here. So in this companion template test, we have a component. It's got a field on it. And then we have a standalone template file. And we run this through rewrite module. And then we spit out the debug string. And we get this thing. And so this, like I said, is a textual representation of that mapping tree that we just spent mm -hmm. all that work building up. And so what we're looking at is saying, OK, there is a template embedding from 0 to 123 of the template, which is going to be its full length. That corresponds to 131 to 685 in the resulting TypeScript file. And if we scroll over here, this is a little ugly with the quoted things. But you can see, OK, yeah, like this top line here is each array world planet universe. That's mm -hmm. this. And that corresponds to something that's going to be very difficult to see on this narrow screen. But you might begin to recognize, oh, this is the start of our mm -hmm. boilerplate that we looked at last time. And we scroll over, and you can see template for backing value. And we scroll, and we scroll, and we scroll. And we have an init component call to each, which, again, like this is the DSL that we saw last time. Mm -hmm. And so what we've got here is saying, like, OK, all we actually know at this level is we're basically saying the entire template maps to the entire chunk of TypeScript that we replaced it with. But we can drill further and further in. And so we can see here that, OK, at from 3 to 7 in the template, we had a path expression that was each. The corresponding TypeScript is chi.globals each. And we can drill even further and say, OK, the actual identifier there is this. Mm -hmm. um, and as we scroll through this, you'll see OK, we go Same further and further. Yeah. All of our strings yeah. align. Like The deeper in you get, the more the TypeScript and the handlebars tend to look like each other. Mm -hmm. um, not always. You can, here's an example of where we did the emit nothing. We're like, OK, there was some text content here. We want to note that, but we emitted no TypeScript for it, 472 to 472. That's a zero length span. And so this allows us, we looked at the transformed module earlier. This is what allows us to answer those questions of like, OK, at this offset in the template, what's going on in TypeScript and vice versa? Right. This is what powers very quickly dive into that, just because it'll allow me to feel like we completed this. Uh, we were looking at index. This is what powers rewrite diagnostic. Um, so we go through. And we say, OK, we have a bunch of diagnostics. We need to find the transformed module for the file that that diagnostic came from. If there isn't, just leave it. Um, so TypeScript is giving us diagnostics against the transform source. That's why you see transform here over and over and over. Um, but once we have the module, we can say, OK, what was the original range for where this diagnostic started and ended? Mm -hmm. And we'll get back the start, the end, the mapping tree, and the actual like source file that it came from. And so here we sort of construct a fake diagnostic because we need to be able to pass it back to TypeScript for formatting and things like that. But it's mostly the same information. We're keeping it around. We're just adjusting like, OK, here are actually the offsets. Here is the file it truly came from if that's different from where it started off. And then finally, we have this rewrite diagnostic, um, or excuse me, augment diagnostic is what we care about. Rewrite diagnostic we're already in. TypeScript diagnostics can be nested. This is where if you ever see something like mm. C, so the original definition over here or something, there's this chain of diagnostics that are all tied together. Um, but the reason we care about the mapping here, the reason this came out at all, is because this gives us the information we need to be able to customize error message for certain cases. So we want to be able to say, like, oh, OK, this is a standard like TypeScript assignability error, except it's actually on a node of type, well, you know, it's on an identifier. And mm -hmm. that identifier is being passed to an attribute. So what we can actually say here is the only way you should ever be getting an, an assignability error specifically on an HTML attribute is if you need to be given something that's an adder value and it's not. And so right. this, is, this is why, in addition to all of the actual location information, we're also keeping a reference to, hey, what AST node in the template actually produced this mapping? Because it lets us do things like this. And that, I think, is the whirlwind tour of at least the transform subset of Glint Core.
<sighs> so with that, I think next time we'll be able to actually see... Okay, so we've, we're kind of backing our way out. We've seen the DSL itself, and now we've seen the transform that generates it. And then if you think back about that architecture stack again, the thing that pushes into that is from the rest of Glit core. It's the CLI or the language server. And so next time we might pick up a couple pieces or details here or there, but we'll actually be able to see kind of the last major chunk of that architecture diagram we showed of, okay, how do we, how do we invoke the transform? And then we'll actually have that end-to-end -end view. So now we understand the template, DSL. We understand how you get the template DSL given these things, but what pushes in those, you know, we talked about, Dan helpfully corrected me that no, we already have the script, scripts, but how do we get them? How do we know that there's, ah, there should be a route.ts that we're passing in as the associated script, et cetera, at that point. So we're getting there. Anything else to say before we wrap up, Dan? I don't think so. I think I've talked more than enough. <laughs> Thank you for your time, and thanks, everybody, for watching. Uh, as we've said before, if you have questions, let us know. We're probably going to be recording the next one before this one's even up or shortly after this one's up. Uh, but we're also happy if and as we have the ability to do little bits of follow-up here and there. I'm probably not going to spend an hour on follow-up because, oh boy. But hopefully these are helpful. Thanks for watching, and we'll be back soon. <laughs>